This is the first planting of Pinot Noir in the Willamette Valley. This is what David and I did for our honeymoon in 1966. What, what brought you to Oregon? Why would you think of Pinot Noir and think of coming to Oregon to plant Pinot Noir? When I was uh, attending UC Davis back in the early 60s, uh, I had a professor there who said one day, there's no climate in California cool enough for Pinot Noir. And I had discovered Pinot Noir at Davis, and uh, I loved it. So I started doing research at the Davis Library <clears throat> on various places in the world where Pinot Noir might do better. One of them was the Willamette Valley, the others were northern Portugal and South Island of New Zealand, where nothing was going on then either. We have a small planting in northern Portugal at a friend's place now too, just for the fun of it. But the ultimate is the Willamette Valley. What's perfect about the Willamette Valley? Why, why Pinot Noir and why here? We have a cool, even growing season. This is a secret that is no secret at all. It's known to most uh, fruit growers. And that is when, when fruit ripens slowly and evenly, it preserves its flavors. And that's the whole idea with planting Pinot Noir here is to retain the sort of ephemeral varietal characteristic of Pinot Noir. And you can only do it in a climate this cool. Can you d describe those characteristics of Pinot Noir? What's perfect Pinot Noir to you? Pinot Noir that tastes like Pinot Noir. <laughs> not oak, not raspberries, not brambles, not smoke, toast, you know, all of that silliness. Uh, Pinot Noir should taste like Pinot Noir. Have you ever heard a strawberry described as, oh, this has a great Pinot Noir taste? No. The whole idea here is to capture the varietal characteristic of all the grapes that we grow here in this valley. But P Pinot can have a couple of different tastes, can it not? Pinot can they have a couple of hundred different right. tastes. Yeah. So there is not one Pinot, Pinot taste? No. There is a varietal characteristic that's reflected in Pinot Noir and that has to do with where it's grown. It has a lot to do with where the vineyard is much more so than any alchemy played in the winery. Talk about the differences between soils and elevation and some of the things that you've discovered seen. Well this place, the Red Hills of Dundee, when I first came here I avoided. I knew they were perfect, good soils at relatively low elevations and good exposures. However, the subdivisions were beginning to creep into Dundee even then. So I avoided the Dundee Hills. I looked around this valley for two years. And this place came up for sale and it was just too perfect. The soil is, it's classified as a fairly heavy soil. Talk for a second about, uh, once again, UC Davis and when you were there and Pinot Noir and other places like Burgundy. Well, Pinot Noir, <clears throat> back in 1964 when I graduated from Davis was almost unheard of in California. It became, I don't know many Pinot Noirs that were labeled varietally. Uh, the only places in the, the only place in the world where Pinot Noir had any validity was Burgundy. Um, so I thought we'd find some place else that had validity. And that kept coming back to be the Willamette Valley. I traveled in Europe for almost a year after I graduated from Davis. And I kept asking growers, why do you grow a certain variety here? I mean, in Burgundy, it's tough to ripen grapes, just like it is here. In Bordeaux, it's tough to ripen the varieties they grow there. They could grow those varieties in Provence and ripen them every year, quote unquote, but they don't get the flavor. Same in Burgundy. They could go down the Rhone Valley, it ain't far away, and they can make big, dark, deep Pinot Noirs but they don't have the varietal characteristic of the Pinot Noir. They don't have the flavor. So that's why we're here. Maybe, maybe just talk about uh, climate uh, and if you had a hierarchy of uh, important things with Pinot Noir, where would climate, soils... That's good, that's good. Yeah. Okay. 
My studies at UC Davis primarily focused on climate as the major contributing factor to the grape's quality, and that's most certainly true. The, there are Europeans who give a lot of credence to the soil. Uh, the soil certainly has a, plays a factor, is a factor. But overall, the climate is what is the, is what perfects the grape on the vine. The soil drainage is important. The elevation is important. It's much cooler at higher elevations here in the Willamette Valley as it is in Burgundy. If you look at the Premier Cruz in Burgundy, they're about in the middle of the slope, and that's about where we are here. And, uh, but primarily, the climate is what I chose the Willamette Valley for, and I selected varieties that would fit this climate. And that was a concept that was pretty new to the new world at that point. It was a shotgun approach, you know, plant Zinfandel next to Palomino, next to Pinot Noir. Uh, we selected varieties that were primarily Pinot varieties, Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc, Pinot Meunier, and Chardonnay, which grows next to Pinots in Burgundy. And they're early maturing varieties and they just fit this climate. Planting Nebbiolo here, as some people have recently, it's going to ripen about one every 12 years, I would guess. <laughs> well, that's not a good investment. People reinventing the wheel every day. Mm -hmm. you, you were talking about planting one variety side of another. How about planting Pinot Noir side of housing developments? And, <laughs> and what, uh, what's gone on in Oregon that you have helped lead uh, to protect lands? Well, as I indicated earlier, the, the Dundee Hills looked like they were going to be sacrificed to subdivisions. Um, and the land use laws, which came into effect with Senate Bill 100 in 1973, sort of put a stop to that. And that's why you can still look out over this Willamette Valley and see a valley that I looked at out, out at um, 35, 37 years ago. And it's changed, but it hasn't changed dramatically. It's not subdivisions. Subdivisions and agriculture do not coexist very well. People think they do, but they don't. What, what exactly does the, uh, does the state bill say in Friends of Oregon, Thousand Friends of Oregon, things like that? Well, Senate Bill 100 set aside <coughs> farmland as valuable. And if you look at agriculture in Oregon, it's been the sustaining economic influence through all the boom and bust of the timber industry and of the the uh, electronics industry and so on, agriculture brings in, what, $300 million a year? Or is it $3 billion a year? I don't know, you can check the figures. But it's a sustaining force. And so what Senate Bill 100 did was attempt to lock up this valley as an agricultural preserve almost, which it is, it should be. There shouldn't be any houses in this valley as far as I'm concerned, except dwellings for farms. But uh, it has been under constant pressure from developers ever since the day of inception. And a group called Thousand Friends of Oregon has pretty much been the watchdog of these land use laws. And uh, it's the reason why the valley still looks the way it does. You're talking about protecting lands. How about protecting lands in other ways? Uh, how about uh, better living through chemistry versus the way you've always done it. Uh, there is a definite movement in Oregon and in the uh, viticulture industry to become more organic in terms of growing. This vineyard you're standing in, which is the oldest in the Willamette Valley, has been grown organically since day one. I've never used a herbicide underneath the rows, pesticides, or systemic fungicides in here. We use basic elements like sulfur and some copper at the end of the season. And we have developed over the, you know, you can't make an ecosystem in five years. You can't decide I'm going to go organic and just stop using stuff and all of a sudden everything's okay. But this ecosystem functions in, in ways that I guess are ego satisfying to me because it really works. I don't have to do all this messing around and I like to drink the wine that I make. And I think other people ought to know it's safe, too. Uh, 
talk about the about whether it was meaningful at all uh, and how meaningful to get validation from the outside that yes indeed your initial thoughts were the correct ones this was a great place for Pinot Noir talk about uh, the 79 and 80 uh, Go Mayo tastings or any other validation that you think is uh, meaningful <coughs> I was I was fairly amazed, you know, when we when we started here I indicated that Pinot Noir was fairly unknown in the New World. And uh, it's a difficult variety to grow because it's it's just not as resistant to everything as Cabernet is or Merlot or its relatives, which we couldn't ripen here anyway. Um, but Pinot Noir we started making in nineteen seventy, we planted the vineyard in sixty six cuttings in 65 down near Corvallis, but the 70s, I guess 1970 was the year, my first year of making wine. I had a California education. I did absolutely everything wrong. The wine came out thin and tart. I picked the grapes too early, and it was just a nothing wine. And I was embarrassed to call it Pinot Noir. We called it Oregon Spring Wine. Sold it for 265 a bottle. Had 250 cases. Took about three years to sell that. So along comes 1979, and a friend in Burgundy said, Why don't you send some of your Pinot Noir over to Paris for this tasting at Gomio, which is the French equivalent of Gourmet Magazine? And I did, and we came in pretty well. I think we did third with the Grand Connoisseurs, whatever that was. But at that same time, the only Burgundy competition there was from an, a shipper of dubious quality. So Robert Drouin decided that if Drouin wines had been representing Burgundy, the New World wines would not have done as well. So he called a rematch using the same judges, same wines, same everything, except it was in Burgundy and the next year. And Irie's 75 South Block, the one that was in Paris, came in second behind a 59 Chambon Moussigny. Out of 100 points, it was two tenths of a point away. And immediately, we were get, it hit the Herald Tribune International. We were getting calls from Jamaica to Hong Kong. How do we get this wine? And we had made so little of it that I sold a few bottles for $20 a bottle. I probably could have sold it for four times that much, even then. And we still have a little of it left. And the wonderful thing about that wine is that it's aged beautifully. And still today in 2004, it's still at a plateau of beauty. And that particular tasting just sort of made Oregon. It certainly made us, but it, it certainly helped Oregon because after 1980, things really started happening in this valley. What other types of validation have you had that you thought were significant, speaking of Bruin? Uh, well, the fact that Veronique calls me her papa in Oregon. <laughs> say, say that. Uh, uh, Oh, we're very close to the Drouin family, and we have been since, well, actually before that tasting. I met Robert in 1964 uh, when I was in France. Uh, but we're quite close to the family, and Veronique does call me her papa in Oregon, and I wish she were my daughter in France, or <laughs> preferably in Oregon. <laughs> Is winemaking still fun for you? Oh, sure. Why else would I be doing this? Besides the fact I'm unemployable. <laughs> uh, yeah, because every year here, here we are standing in almost middle of June and it's gray and cloudy and we have some iffy things going on in the vineyard. And every year is exciting here. You know, in warmer climates, we won't mention which ones, but warmer climates in Oregon, you prune the vines to the amount of crop level you want and you do the standard vineyard procedures and you go through the season and you pick them when you want. There's no rain threatening. And it's boring. This is fun. Yeah, it's fun to grow grapes in Oregon.
and make wine here. You've mentioned growing grapes and making wine. Uh, what about the winemaking uh, side of things? Uh, is that uh, a fairly minor side relative to grape growing, or uh, have there been innovations there? I was looking back through a bunch of magazines I have the other day, and I looked through one 20-year-old magazine touting this brand new state-of-the-art equipment, which is in 2004 being touted as brand new state-of-the-art equipment. I, you know, winemaking essentially is a 5,000-year-old institution, if you will, and it's natural. I think the important thing, if you ask any grape grower in Burgundy, or anywhere, or winemaker, pardon me, where, what do you do to your wines? to make them so wonderful. He'll point out to his vineyard. And that's, you know, this is, this is where the wine is created. As far as I'm concerned, the best thing I can do as a human being is keep my hands off it in the winery. And the same here in the vineyard. So we just sort of let natural processes take place here, and, and it works. Well, I guess to summarize uh, the point that, that I was making earlier, um, the climate is risky here for growing Pinot Noir, but it's also the reason for being here because you don't get, you don't achieve anything without some risk. And this is, as I said, kind of fun risk. I do not visit many casinos because I have one right out here. I should say that the state of the art in Oregon viticulturally in terms of growing Pinot varieties is probably 30 years ahead of California. And I say that with an education from California. But when I came up here, I did things the way I was taught at UC Davis. And that was I had a two-wire trellis and I let the vines flop. It's called California Sprawl in viticulture parlance. And we came up with the idea of positioning the shoots vertically and we had kids from the high school come out and tie each shoot to the wire, throw clods at each other and so on. So we discovered catch wires in Germany which holds those things up. Catch wires were an innovation in Oregon. Vertical trellising was an innovation in Oregon. We had friend, friends here from Switzerland who's done a lot of cool climate research, Werner Koblet who was walking through the vineyard one day in 1980, the Chardonnay section, and he said, you need to pull leaves here. He said, these leaves are useless. These are just sinks for carbohydrates at this point. Get rid of the leaves, get some air circulation. All of a sudden, guess what? Leaf pulling has become the thing to do all over the world. I think probably the first leaves pulled in the United States were right here. I don't know, but pretty close to. And we've just continued to innovate here because we have to innovate here. We have a climate that dictates to us, do it this way or you won't get any grapes. <laughs> and, you know, there, there is some current thinking. A lot of people have come up here and put in drip irrigation. Well, we get about 40 inches of rain a year in the Willamette Valley. These vines were planted because we didn't have money to buy cultivation equipment. We augered holes in this kind of turf and they've never been irrigated. They were irrigated as cuttings in a nursery, but never, and this is the oldest vineyard in the state. Somehow I think irrigation is counterproductive, and actually you lose your Appalachian Control A in, in France if you do irrigate vines in a, in a premier vineyard. So there are some things here that I think are a little bit misdirected these days. Close planting I could go into at great length, I had a fellow here the other day who said, oh boy, what you could do is just plant a row in between these. And I said, why would I do that? <laughs> but as I said, we can go off on that at, long, at great length. Um, there are a number of other things. As far as I'm concerned, enological, uh, so-called, the new technology of enology, there are some useful things to apply, but they really have to be looked at. In technology from the time I was a student of philosophy many, many years ago, prior to Davis, technology was something I looked at as something 
that can be a tool to use, but just because it's available, you don't use it. Just because it's there, just because you have an atomic bomb, you don't use it. But there are a lot of people that just try anything new, and it's, it's a fad-driven kind of thing. And I just don't believe in... I'd rather create fads and follow them. <laughs>